10 SQL Tricks Every Data Scientist Should Know, Part 1. Data scientists should know SQL. Um, in fact, all professionals working with data and analytics should know SQL. To some extent, SQL is an underrated skill for data science because it has been taken for granted as a necessary yet uncool way of extracting data out from the database. So the ultimate goal really is to fit these data into pandas or tidyverse, which are more fancier ways to wrangle your data. However, as massive data being collected and churned out every single day in the industry, as long as our data stored in a SQL compliant database, SQL is still the most proficient tool to help you investigate, filter, and aggregate to get a thorough understanding of your data. By slicing and dicing with SQL, analysts are allowed to identify patterns that worth further looking into. And this oftentimes will lead to refine the analysis population and variables to be considerably smaller than the initial scope. Therefore, rather than transferring huge data sets into Python or R, the first step of analytics should be using SQL to gain informative insights into your data. Working in real-world relational databases, SQL is way more than just a select, join, order by statements. As the first part of this mini-series, I will discuss six tips to make your analytics work more efficient with SQL. And I will also show you how we can integrate SQL with other programming languages like Python and R. So let's dive into this. For this exercise, we will work in Microsoft SQL Server. Um, the toy data we are playing around with is this table. Um, I wrote a quick guide on how to get this data into Microsoft SQL Server without manually typing in everything. And um, I will have this article linked down below if you'd like to follow along with this video. And now a very quick overview of the toy dataset. So we have the first variable as the ID variable, and uh, this one will be used as the join key. And then the next variable is our sequence variable coded as um, sequence numbers. And the third variable is a string variable where missing values are coded as empty or blank. So the fourth one is also a string variable, but the missing values are coded as null, as we can see here. And then next one is also an empty string variable. Um, so, but the difference is that the missing values are coded as a word and nay. And next up is our numeric variable with all these floating numbers. And we do have additional two date variables in our data. So the first trick is to use coalesce to recode null or missing values in our data. Now let's use the function coalesce to code our null variable as the word missing. So the second argument in this coalesce variable is the values we want to assign to this um, missing value. And then we're going to do the same for this empty string variable. Again, we're going to code it as missing. Run this chunk of code. Here is the return, and our null variable is now coded as the word missing, as we expected. So by using the function coalesce, we are able to assign the specific value to treat the missing variable. And then we do notice another thing is that for this empty string variable, when we use coalesce, seems like it doesn't really do anything because all this empty string also shows up the same as the raw value after uh, we recode with the function coalesce. So this does bring up one caveat of coalesce, and that is it doesn't work for empty string or NA string. So what should we do? Well, um, one 
way to do this is to use the case when statement. So let's see my case when function when my empty string equals missing. Then what we do? Then we say, okay, that's an empty missing. And this we call it case when um, for empty string variable. Next, we're going to do the same for this NA string variable where we say case when our NA string variable equals NA, then we call them as NA missing. And we call this variable case when NA string variable. So running this chunk of code, here is a return. As we can see by using coalesce, the empty string variable doesn't really change. However, after we use the case when statement, the empty strings are coded as empty missing. And then the same thing for this NA string. When we use coalesce, it doesn't do anything. However, when we use the case when, then we can see the word NA is now coded as NA missing. So basically, this is one caveat um, that we should pay attention to when we use the function coalesce. Trick number two is to compute running total and cumulative frequency. So running total can be useful when we are interested in the total sum, but not individual value at a given point for potential analysis population segmentation and outlier identification. Now let's see how we can do running total and frequency in SQL. Here is our toy data. So what we are interested in is to calculate the cumulative sum for this numeric variable. To solve this, we need to divide this task into two steps. So step number one, we need to calculate the cumulative sum prior to the current row. For example, on the second row, we need to sum up the first two values in this numeric variable. And then the step number two would be to calculate the total sum for all the rows in this table. So for the first step, we can use the SQL command row unbounded proceeding, which basically is to apply the analytics function to all the rows prior to this current row. Because we're going to do the cumulative sum, we're going to use the analytics function sum of this numeric variable um, over order by this numeric variable because we are um, sorting it from the smallest to the largest in order to get the cumulative sum. So we see rows um, bounded proceeding. And we give this variable as cumulative sum. So we now we only look at one ID variable to get a sense of what this does. And by running this chunk of code and uh, subsetting on this one particular ID, we can see the variable cumulative sum summing all the values prior to this current row, 125.42, is a sum of 62.71 plus 62.71. And then the same thing for the third row, 188.16, is a sum of 62.71, 62.71, and 62.74. So this is exactly what we want in terms of calculating the cumulative sum. And now let's move on to the next part, which is the summation over all our table. Here is a little trick where we will maintain a flag variable indicating all the rows in this table. So what we can do is to use a case one statement again. So we say case one, the ID variable is not null, which includes all the rows in our table. Then we assign the value one, and then we call it John. ID. So again, we only look at this one variable and then all the rows for this ID will be coded as one for this join ID variable. And now this is just for only one ID. If we run it for um, all the IDs, here is the return where we created all this cumulative sum variable for all the values. And then we create this join ID flag for all the rows in this table. So the next step to finish off our current task, which is to calculate the cumulative sum. So let's see, we're going to calculate the sum of our um, numeric variable over 
petition by John ID. So this will create the total sum of all rows in this table. And then the next step to calculate the cumulative frequency, we say, okay, we'll use the cumulative sum divided by the sum of our numeric variable, which is the total. And again, over petition by this join ID, our flag variable. And in order to get a nice, pretty looking return, we're going to round this output to the fourth decimal. And at very last, order by this cumulative frequency. Let's run for this particular ID. As we can see, cumulative frequency is what we are showing up here. And now let's get rid of this ID, run the same thing for all the values we have. We maintain the numeric variable as the raw value. And then we have this total sum, which is the sum of all the rows. And we calculate the corresponding cumulative frequency by using this number divided by the total sum. Again, there are two tricks here. So first we use the row unbounded proceeding uh, to calculate the sum of all prior values up to this point. And then the second, we create a join ID to calculate the total sum. Based on this cumulative frequency table, we can see that the last record is definitely an outlier here. And next up, trick number three is to find the records with extreme values without self-joining. And now going back to our table, so our task here is to return the rows with the largest numeric variable value for each unique ID. So for example, if we only look at this particular ID, we're going to return the maximum value of this numeric variable, which is 424.99. The first solution on top of a head might be, okay, we first calculate the largest value for each particular ID, and then we can self-join. So here is what we would do to calculate the maximum numeric value as maximum numeric variable. And then we're going to do the same thing using the group by ID for all these IDs. And the return for this table would be all the maximum values associated with each ID. And then next, we're going to join this table back to our original table on both ID variable and the numeric value variable equals our um, the maximum value calculated from this inner part and running this chunk of code gives us the corresponding maximum variable associated with each ID. And this definitely works. But now let's see if there is any more concise way to do this. So the trick here is to use the case when numeric variable equals the maximum value of our numeric variable over petition by the particular ID because we're going to find the maximum value for each ID and then call this variable yes, if not, call it no. So we label this variable as the maximum number indicator. Now let's run this chunk for all the rows that contain maximum value for this particular ID, the maximum number indicator will get a value yes. So this is basically our flag variable we can subset on. And next one, all we need to do is to, you know, subset on this particular numeric indicator as yes. So running this chunk of code, we can see now we have selected all the maximum values for each ID variable, including you know, the duplicated ones because this 135.13 is the maximum value and it happened multiple times. Trick number four, conditional where clause. So everyone knows the where clause in SQL for subsetting. I find myself using conditional where clause more often. 
and let's see how we can do this conditional where clause using our toy data. We want to only keep the rules satisfying the following logic. Let's see, when sequence variable is in one, two, three, and the difference between the two date variable has to be greater or equal to zero. And then when sequence number in four, five, six, the difference between the two date variable has to be greater than one. And then for the others, the difference between the date variable has to be greater than two. So that's the rules that we want to keep. And how we can do this? We want to use the conditional where clause. So here, in order to calculate the difference between these two date variables, um, we need to use a function called date diff between these two date variables. We say date one and date variable two. So what this uh, date diff function does is it will return the days in between these two dates. And then when the difference between these dates is greater than sequence number in one, two, three, and then we see it has to be greater than zero because that is the first condition in our where clause. And then we see when sequence variable is in four, five, six, then this different in date has to be greater than one. And that is the second condition in our where command. And else, the difference has to be greater than two. And that is the last one. So we put an end in there. And to finish it up, show the date difference between this two date variable one and date variable two. We call it lag in dates. Let's run this chunk of code and also compare it with our original table. Now looking at the output table, we see that the fourth and fifth sequence for this particular ID 19064 got eliminated because the date difference between these two records are zero. And for all the sequence variable in four, six, and five, the difference has to be greater or equal to one. So that's why these two rows are eliminated from our output. There you have it, part one of our mini series, 10 SQL tricks every data scientist should know. And in this video, we went through the first four. So stay tuned for part two, where we will talk about the additional six SQL tricks. So hope you've enjoyed this video or even better, hope that you've learned something new. I will make sure to have all the data sets, full code and resources linked in the description down below. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, bye folks.